Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I am Gerard V. Bradley, professor of law at the University of Notre Dame, and this is the beginning of a six-hour course on First Amendment problems. I just recited the text of the First Amendment. What is the problem? Is it the First Amendment itself? Is there something in the First Amendment which is hostile to the common good of our society? The answer is no. There is nothing necessarily in the First Amendment. There is no necessary meaning or reading of the First Amendment which is hostile to the common good. Indeed, when ratified and made part of our fundamental law in 1791, the First Amendment was, frankly, ahead of its time. Since then, it's been a mainstay of our successful experiment in democracy and been a model for other aspiring democracies across the world. But the problem begins with the question, what exactly does the First Amendment mean? And the problem has to do not with the entire First Amendment. For instance, the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. While an important statement about the source of power in our society has not played a very important role in our fundamental law. It has not been contested, nor has it been subject to much judicial definition. So the problem, if there is one, really pertains to what are called the religion clauses, no law respecting an establishment, prohibiting the free exercise of religion, and a freedom of speech and a freedom of press clause. What do they mean? They're not self-defining. And looking again carefully at the text of the First Amendment, one can see that the ratifiers, the people who approved the First Amendment and made it part of our law, had something definite in mind. They said the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press. And what does respecting an establishment of religion really mean? Now, in our system, it has come to be the case that the Supreme Court of the United States is the final arbiter of constitutional meaning. So the problem, at least at this point, can be stated as follows. What meaning has the Supreme Court found in those words of the First Amendment? And has judicial interpretation of the First Amendment been a good thing for our society? Now we come to the problem, the thesis of these six lectures. The common good of our society has been harmed by mistaken interpretations of the First Amendment by our courts, especially and finally authoritatively by our Supreme Court. Further, we would be better off if some of these interpretations were reversed, modified, eliminated. We would be better off if, in fact, we restored the Constitution the meaning of the First Amendment as it was understood by the people who gave it life in the late 18th century. We would be better off if we restored this meaning to our constitutional law. Now the plan of the six lectures. The first lecture is on the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment and what I will call, following here, the Reverend Richard John Newhouse, the naked public square a space denuded of religion uh, set up, called into being by the Supreme Court as its interpretation of the Establishment Clause. Lecture two on the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment and its contribution to building and sustaining the naked public square included in lecture two is an extended discussion of a law, a statute, a congressional enactment called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, RIFRA, and its invalidation that is held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in June of 1997. Lecture three, Secularism, 
and the Constitution. Lecture three, in lecture three, I shall bring together elements of the first two lectures into a new thesis, a refined thesis, that the Supreme Court has brought us a secularized public realm. So much, the first three lectures, is largely a matter of description. What has the Supreme Court wrought? The final two uh, three lectures will turn to a, first a deeper understanding of what the Supreme Court has wrought and also some criticism and some possibilities for reform. Lecture four. Having laid out the problem with the First Amendment, as a matter of judicial interpretation of the First Amendment, we'll take a long look at the work of John Courtney Murray, a great Jesuit philosopher and theologian who died in 1967, but lived long enough to detect, to diagnose, and correctly diagnose the trajectory towards the naked public square set by the Supreme Court in the late 1940s in its foundational church, state, or religion clause decisions. Murray set out a way of understanding the First Amendment which was different from the Supreme Court's understanding. It was at once an implicit criticism of the court and also a means by which faithful Catholics might reconcile themselves to a regime such as ours in light of the First Amendment which was not, again, which was not going to recognize publicly as a matter of state action the truth of the Catholic religion. I will propose in lecture four that this project of Murray's is unsurpassably instructive for us, but ultimately unsuccessful. Lecture five will step back and take a look at Catholic institutions, schools, including colleges, hospitals, charities, to see how they have fared in the secular public realm. There are some warning signs here, and we will look at them. This lecture involves some consideration of the legal constraints upon faithful witness by these institutions, but looks more carefully and more fully at the self-understanding of these institutions in our secular society. Finally, lecture six, possibilities for reform. What can be done to rein in our courts to arrest further development of their mistaken interpretations of the Constitution, even to reverse, modify, or eliminate some of the bad effects of their mistaken interpretations? Now you can see that most of the lectures have to do with the religion clauses of the First Amendment. This does not necessarily mean that we will not also be talking at times about the free speech and free press clauses. But as will become clearest in the course of lecture three, all these clauses or elements of the First Amendment have come together in judicial hands under the rubric of something they call, our judges call, a freedom of expression, freedom of self-expression, a right of autonomy. So that there has come to be, according to our judges, one undifferentiated right in the various clauses of the First Amendment, and it's a right to personal autonomy.